So they do all kinds of crazy things, make uh, pictures of me, make fun of me on their radio show and everything. They're ascended masters. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I got everything I need. I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree. And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me. And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee. Just like my straight white male dad did to me. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got all the luck I need. I've got a pile of broken mirrors and I'm walking under ladders and I'm spilling tons of salt, but to me that doesn't matter because my skin and my gender and my orientation are the best things to have if you live in this nation. I recommend it highly. a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree. We usually do this show at uh, 7pm Pacific on Wednesdays, but it's been hot as fuck out so we're uh, doing it at a uh, 9 p.m. Pacific tonight with the under the red lights because it's sexy time or something. <laughs> anyway, you can support this project at patreon.com slash echoplex or eplex.store or just go to echoplexmedia.com and click the support us link and uh, find other ways to support the project. I don't know. Tell a friend, tell an enemy, tell your mom. Um, Producer Dave, you can find me on Grinder. And I'm HK Perrin. You can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash sylphweed. That's my name in the chat. And you can find me on Mastodon at hparrin at port87.social. That's fantastic. So we're doing a bit of a, if you could imagine this, this is a bit of a crossover with our Cults in the Satanic Panic uh, coverage. There's this guy. Mm. His name is Jamie Mustard. He's been peddling a cure for PTSD to former Scientologists. And um, it is um, not proven to uh, have any effect on uh, PTSD. And I, I feel like if I talk too much about the cure, then we're the pointless to run this content. Um, but yeah, this guy claims to have found a cure for PTSD and he's running around grifting people who used to be in a cult, which is if I, if I could go out on a limb i could say that's uh, highly unethical <laughs> yes indeed that was the uh, other we were going to either call this the intellectual dollar tree or highly unethical would be the other name <laughs> for the fucking show <laughs> <laughs> anyway here we go here is a uh, i don't know who benjamin a boyce is but he has almost a hundred thousand subscribers and uh he's talking to uh jamie mustard which sounds like a character from Clue. <laughs> Voice of Reason. I'm your host. Benjamin oh, Bruce, shit. You have cats, I, but I want to hate you. Jamie Mustard, a multimedia consultant, teacher, and inter... Uh, you can hate him and like the cats. Yeah, that, that orange one's dumb as fuck. The orange cats are dumb. A artist and designer, <laughs> as well as the author of The Invisible Machine, which covers somewhat of a miracle treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, which... Ooh, ooh, already a big red flag. Miracle treatment, right? Mm-hmm. Already a big red flag. Miracle treatment me usually means these statements have not been evaluated by the Fed Food and Drug Administration, right? They definitely mean that. Right. It means yep. asterisk in tiny <laughs> letters at the bottom of your screen, right? Yep. <laughs> but crazy enough, if you're not the one actually selling the product, uh, you don't have to say that. Yeah, like it's... 
it's so obviously snake oil just from that sentence. Like even the orange cat knows to get the fuck out of here. This interview should be thought of as post-traumatic stress injury, which has to do with the sympathetic nerve system and rebooting that after periods of increased trauma or stress response. In this conversation, we talk about this treatment and its impact and its import. And Jamie opens Post up. Sounds like he's trying out for NPR. And talks about its influence on his own life growing up in the middle of poverty does like a show about smooth jazz on npr where they never actually play any smooth jazz that's what the host sounds like (laughs) east la (laughs) as well as anecdotes of other people who've been affected positively by this treatment and whose ptsd so-called has been alleviated or abated or actually cured also like why the video of the cats why not just have like your logo on the screen Maybe maybe this uh, maybe this guy's logo ended up in that graphic design is my passion Facebook group one time and so he doesn't show it anymore. <laughs> Who fucking knows? 1920s. If you are interested in more information about this treatment or Jamie's other work, links are all in the description. Without further ado, here is Jamie Mustard. And Cor- should I ping Corey? Is he no, coming in with us? I thought so, but I'm totally cool just to pick your brain. I, 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 mean, I think we should. I think he wanted me to do it on my own. I kept asking oh. him, and he kept saying, "But up to you." You know, oh, no, I'm in no, your no, hands. No. He, cool. Yeah, he spe- He he speaks incredibly highly of you, by the way. <laughs> Chat. I trust my health with someone called DJ Mustard before Jamie Mustard. <laughs> yeah, and I'm excited, and I'm really thank you for having me. Absolutely. Oh, it's, it's like right, fucking right. Juan Maserati's goddamn doppelganger too. Look at his evil Juan Maserati. <laughs> He does look like Juan. He's like evil Juan Maserati. Look at that. (laughs) He's been speaking about the work that you've been doing. uh, Oh, no. Oh, no. Our host is thoughtful. Our host is very thoughtful. Very like, oh, think about the work that you've been doing. He's very thoughtful. Very thoughtful. You got to rest, rest your chin on your fist. It's the thoughtful look. Yep. Lipov. Lipov? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's mm-hmm. Dr. Lipov, who is uh, the one actually selling the treatment. So he probably sends this guy around to talk so that he doesn't ever get caught out saying something crazy. <laughs> this crazy new thing. Um, and and Corey told me about his story with it or his experience with this. Uh, so far, it's been described by the people on this podcast as a miracle and crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, so far, I don't know. Maybe the host is like just throwing the most casual shade in the world. <laughs> Cure, therapy, or treatment. We but. can. Well, I mean, I think it's subtle, but it's it's. But what it is is maybe one of the most. I will say, without hyperbole, that I think it's probably the most important medical invention since the discovery of penicillin. What the f- fuck, maybe. you? Um, a cure for PTSD would not be that important, like important. Don't get me wrong, but not as important as penicillin, right? Because not just penicillin, but the penicillin gave rise to other antibiotics. Yeah. Like that basically led to like all of modern medicine, right? At least Maybe not as far all, as, but uh, like, you know, as far as bacterial infections. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe them i think it dwarfs the polio vaccine in terms of lives it can save what the <laughs> fuck <laughs> wow whoa coming in this hot is shows over everybody good night we got what we want <laughs> good night everybody <laughs> all right <laughs> already like just zero to a hundred in two minutes and 26 seconds that includes the intro with the cats we're like yeah we're like, since this started it was like 15 seconds yeah, we're max 45 <laughs> seconds into them talking <laughs> hmm. um i think that it is it is zero to 145 seconds sounds like my old prius <laughs> and there's so many things you know i wouldn't call myself anti-woke i would call <laughs> myself pro-data which probably means- oh oh this is gonna get good oh this guy's get your idw oh bingo cards out everybody this guy's gonna black out the fucking bingo card <laughs> anti-woke right 
Meaning I'm not a big fan of bumper stickers. I'm pretty intersectional. I grew up poor and I'm a mixed person. Yeah. And I, when, I, when I listen to woke people speak, I'm like, they're never from neighborhoods like I grew up in. They don't, it's always middle to class. To woke people? Wait, people can be woke now? Yeah, I, the other thing is like, <clears throat> there's this, and I, don't, I really don't want to get bogged down in this, this wokeness thing, but there are a lot of upper middle class, like fucking white liberals who like lay it on a little thick on the uh, social justice shit maybe to make themselves feel good, but they may actually just fucking believe that shit and happen to be from a, like a higher socioeconomic background. But also there's plenty of people of color from poor communities who are advocating for social justice. My dude, like get the fuck out of here. But like, I thought they were just calling like books and ideas and stuff. Woke. No, they're woke, calling just woke folk. people now. Woke folk. I mean, I understand it started out as like a descriptor you'd provide, you'd give to people, but that's not how the right uses it class uh black people you know i have a cousin that's a uh just i was i almost just dropped a fucking slur <laughs> i was like just say and then i'm like nope don't say that dave don't say that <laughs> <laughs> you know a very accomplished woke kind of activist and writes policy for blm you know what i mean Wait, how do you get a job writing policy for a fucking like decentralized group of activists <laughs> like what the fuck yeah. <laughs> proud of her as my cousin but i'm also and i also think she's smart but i'm also kind of so one of the one of the things that we could talk about i think that a lot of this kind of angry woke um virtue signaling comes from a dysregulated nervous system a physiological <laughs> Wow. Do you, do you remember what this guy's job description was? It was like fucking social media <laughs> marketing person or something like that. <laughs> and I mean, that's a fucking fine thing to be, but now you're talking about the fucking, now you're talking about like a worldview being a, being a result of a fucking, what do you say? Disaggregated nervous system. <laughs> yeah. So like if, if you don't agree with me politically, it's because your nervous system is damaged. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's like, like a nervous system phrenology that's that's quite the position there ah <laughs> <laughs> oh, the host has still got his thoughtful face on <laughs> like it, it couldn't possibly be just that like you know they disagree right that they they see the world differently than you do that's the yeah. one thing that's the one thing that, that we try not to do around here right we try not to be like oh eric weinstein couldn't possibly believe that i'm like i actually think he probably does <laughs> like yep <laughs> yeah we have to and, and if people are telling you like what you what they believe maybe just treat them like they're telling you the truth even if you think what they're saying is fucking cuckoo birds if, if they're fucking grifting or lying or saying something that they don't believe you'll, you might find out later yeah and generally it's like kind of obvious because they'll contradict themselves but sometimes people who actually are true believers still contradict themselves so you know if we had a if we had a bigger audience there'd be people doing super cuts of me contradicting myself all the fucking time i'm quite sure <laughs> I, guess I'm a, I would be a i would be i don't rattle easy but i'd probably be a good rattle you know what i'm saying for somebody <laughs> So that's what, another thing we could talk about outside of, you know, things we could talk about in terms of uh, gender dysphoria and, and that's and how I think that may be related also to the nervous system. What the f yeah, this is so stupid. I'm almost not even offended by it. Right. Like <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, to be clear, we still are offended by it, but it's, it's <laughs> but still, it it's still impressive. Yes, <laughs> it's impressive and offensive. Yeah, well, th so it's a big, it's a huge conversation. And it, it's... Oh, are we already that? Well, we, this is not, this is not the, aren't, isn't it great that we're having this conversation? Yes, this is not a huge even... conversation because this guy is touched on in a very, in a very, like, uncharacteristically Gish Gallup sort of way. This guy's already touched on a... Many topics that he probably knows nothing about. So, so far, he he said he has a cure for PTSD and that PTSD, he implied that PTSD is the underlying cause of being woke, quote unquote. Or that it, or that it's like 
fellow travelers with it because of something having to do with your nervous system. Yeah, like I'm I'm assuming that he meant PTSD when he was talking about like a a nervous system uh, damage or something, uh, which I don't (laughs) think PTSD is a is like physical damage to your nervous system. I don't think that's true, but you know, I'm going off of his weird ass description of it. Juan has something to say about his doppelganger. (laughs) Are you ready? Fuck this dude. (laughs) (laughs) Start. Well, where, where would you like to start? Should we, should we do biographical Uh, or one thing that it says in the press release, which I think friend, it's your interview. Ask the question. This is going to be one of those interviews, like where the guy, he's probably not even really in inter- this. We're going to, we call this, um, what is this? An assisted monologue. We're going to be looking at a guided monologue here. Probably <laughs> not an interview. I mean, call it what it is. It's an infomercial. It probably is. Yeah. <laughs> but at least an infomercial will show you, you'll get a blender. <laughs> catching. So whoever's mm-hmm. doing this press release is really, uh, got their head on straight is that it's kind of challenging the narrative around what post-traumatic stress disorder is um as as an injury of the body yeah yeah, i mean i think we could start with that i mean i don't know your audience i don't know how quickly you want to get into um issues of how the nervous system may relate to these other things it might if you think (laughs) i want to get into them immediately i know nothing about the nervous system other than i have one and that it, it allows me to uh, have certain sensations and it serves other purposes in my body. And I have a feeling that uh, Jamie Mustard, who actually uh, did the murder in the in the conservatory with the candlestick, uh, probably doesn't know anything about it either. <laughs> Wouldn't that be like the most important part of this would be like getting into the details of the nervous system and how he thinks that like damage to the nervous system causes PTSD? Yeah. Oh man, I got to interview this guy. I did reach out. (laughs) I did reach out from like a burner email. We'll see how it goes. Your audience is up for it. It might be good to kind of get into this idea of, and I can explain it very quickly, very powerfully how post-traumatic stress is. (laughs) Explain it very powerfully. Uh, Me too, friend. Me too. (laughs) That was definitely like a Trumpism. This guy's like taking his audio cues from Trump. It's like verbal cues. So someone, uh, Mr. Balls in chat mentioned Scientologists. This guy's peddling this shit to former Scientologists who are like damaged and may be like are often probably suffering from some some kind of stress. Post, I don't know if it's you know diagnosable PTSD or whatever. That's not for me to say. But like <clears throat> showing this out or hawking this off on people who just left a call is fucking gross. I don't even care what the treatment is. Yeah. When you find out what the treatment is. You're going, you're going to get very angry, by the way, HK, you're going to be very angry when you find out what the uh, nature of the treatment is. If he ever, to be fair though, this is going to be one of those episodes. I feel like where we're going to be an hour and a half in and like 15 minutes into this fucking video. I'm going to guess that it's something like, like essential oils or something. Just some like thing you take once a day or something that is like meaningless. Ooh. Far more invasive and creepy. Oh, really? Mm. But no, okay. but no, it's not butt stuff, I promise. <laughs> 100% of biological injury. And even the most cynical person we can open up with this that might be listening, if I kind of give this brief narrative of why we know it's true, nobody could argue with it. Hmm. We call it a broken leg you can't see. Right. And so it's, it's, you know, we have all these, to be fair, I broke my arm recently and I I couldn't see it. That's why they had to use an x-ray machine. Bad analogy friend, bad analogy. Yeah. Like that's one of the injuries that like, it's actually like kind of hard to see. And if you I mean, can I guess see if, like, it, you're, if, you're, if your bones like snapped in half, like, yeah, yeah you, you would notice that. But like, usually when someone says when, like, usually a break is like a, like a hairline fracture, you know what I'm right. talking about? Yeah. If Where it doesn't can, go all the way if, through the bone. If you can see your broken leg, it is broken very badly. <laughs> yeah. With this Especially if it's like body. protruding out the skin. That's like, all right, we're, that's enough. That's enough. Right. And so, <laughs> okay. you know, we have all these people walking around with this physical injury in their body. Yeah. And they act a little crazy because it makes you crazy. 
and we're telling that's them, a horrible way to talk about somebody with ptsd fuck this everything this guy says is terrible that really is yeah uh i really don't like this guy i've been trying to stop using the word crazy and to the extent that i still use it i've been trying to only use it to describe patterns of behavior and like not individuals but then even then if somebody has like a mental illness or like some kind of mental condition describing their behavior as crazy is still fucked up and you shouldn't do it you should be this guy should be a little more thoughtful about his words if he's like mm -hmm. out there trying to help uh, people who are uh, living with ptsd they have a mental disorder i mean it's pretty fucked up that's like to give somebody that stigma when um they have a physical condition like you wouldn't see somebody with a broken leg and go you have broken leg disorder get over it okay. you know what's wrong with yeah. you how come you can't well that's like literally that? what we do though we just like put a cast on it and then we're like you'll get over it eventually right we just don't use the word disorder we're like <laughs> friend your, your leg's broken here here's your <laughs> yeah. treatment plan you will get over yeah your it. treatment is don't move it for a month right <laughs> <laughs> right, this is going to suck, but we're going to have to immobilize it. We just don't use the word. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't use the word disorder for it, but it is a disorder in your leg. Like sometimes we'll go in there and put like screws in it, right? Like other people, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's incredibly stigmatizing. We can get into that. I am, you know, interested in talking about it. Is like, it you know, like I feel like the only one in this conversation who has stigmatized it is him, right? He just called it crazy. Yeah is you know we we live at a time where we're marketing to people that um it's unsafe to be female we're on we're marketing this to, to little girls i mean they've never had access to that kind of before the internet little girls were not being told from the time they were eight years old nine years old 12 years old 10 years old that it's unsafe to be a woman right so i do think really like really really he doesn't think the girls in the 50s were told hey maybe like don't be alone at night right or or it was worse in the 50s right because the version of unsafe was you're showing a little too much knee it was it was i mean the version up. of unsafe was like you know there's never going to be any consequences because there's no cameras outside looking looking around right well but i mean yeah uh, mothers have always told their daughters to like go out in groups not always, but, but I mean, you know, there were times, I guess, when we didn't have language yet, but, <laughs> but that was a long <laughs> yeah. fucking time ago. I feel like this guy is, is very out of touch. <laughs> yeah. Like what the, f what the fuck, what the absolute <laughs> fuck, dude, this is the worst person. Listen, we've, the intellectual dollar tree is a collection of some of the worst people in the world. And I feel like, I feel like this guy's we're five five minutes 45 seconds into this video and the first minute and a half of so of it was cats and uh this guy <laughs> this guy is already like climbing that ladder of the worst people we've ever fucking done on this show <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, the chronic stress of for young girls being on social media you can get an overactive sympathetic nervous system which is a biological injury to your body and i can explain the science and anatomy of it yeah. from chronic stress it's actually the more common way of getting it what they call it prolonged allostatic load there's guys that come back so here pause, pause for one second because like the two things that he said were unrelated like telling someone that like, Hey, you should be careful because it's unsafe out there is different from like them interacting with social media and feeling like stress over that. Like, like yes, I will agree that like young girls being on social media causes them to stress and in general exacerbates any sort of depression that they could have or might even cause it. I don't know. I haven't read the studies, but you know, that's different than like telling someone, Hey, like don't go outside alone at night. Like we've always done that. <laughs> or if you're walking, you know, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a woman and you're walking alone at night, walk with purpose, walk like you have a destination. Keep it yeah, and like, hold your keys in between your, your look, knuckles. Yeah, so sure, like, sure. 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 You know, sure. You can, <laughs> but this is different too, because like, <laughs> this is the opposite of going out, right? This is sitting there. The, the And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but, uh, sitting there scrolling social media particularly instagram gives people not just women but um men too 
stress because they feel like they're not living up to the lives of the people they're seeing on social media who are like taking a picture in front of a fucking, if it's a man, if they're taking a picture in front of a Lambo, they don't own or whatever. And I don't, and if it's a woman, she's like on some, you know, if she's like a, an influencer, she might be on some awesome vacation or whatever, but maybe, you know, maybe it isn't what it seems, but these are unrelated. This is completely unrelated shit here. <laughs> operators uh i i like hack all the things advice in the chat dress like a clown to to assert dominance <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not saying like that's a good or bad thing to tell a girl to like you know carry her keys in in her knuckles or something i'm just saying that we do that that's that has been a common thing for like many decades so he was incorrect in saying that that's a new phenomenon. And it's, I mean, it's not just, you know, it's not just good advice for women, just anybody. If you're out and about like fucking pay attention what the fuck's going on around you. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, fucking, you might get hit by a train or something if you're not. Is really just an overactive sympathetic nervous system. These are guys that maybe they were never even in a firefight. Just the fear of the IED and being away from their families and not coming home, carrying that stress for a year, they will come back with a biological injury to their body. That is the exact same biological injury that I received growing up in poverty near downtown LA. And that is the exact same biological injury that young women are truly young people, but young women are experiencing with uh, social media going onto phones. And that's why we're seeing the preteen suicide rates that we're seeing and, and all sorts of um, depression, anxiety, hypervigilance. I don't hyper think it's all. exactly the same. Like, I think being in a war zone and being on social media, like both of them could be damaging to your mental health, but not in the same way. Like, what is he basing this on? I, I'm not going to believe him unless he provides some sort of evidence. This guy seems to be, he's, <clears throat> he's very, I thought this we might have a little bit of trouble with this, but this guy's very much in the fucking purview of this show. Just like all these things that he claims to have this knowledge about, which is like it's unrealistic even for like somebody who's an expert in the nervous system. In fact, if somebody was an expert in the nervous system, they wouldn't be telling you all this shit that they're an expert about, actually, right? They <laughs> they, they, they would they would know what they don't know. <laughs> yep. Injury, and we can get into. I mean, I don't know how deep you want me to go now, so that you know. Yeah, let's so, go. Let's go. So, so I, I like this. I like this line of inquiry. So, how okay. is prolonged? Stress? Friend, you haven't inquired about anything. You're just letting this guy talk. Yes. How does that injure? Yeah, I mean, listen. When what would they go, cut out? When you experience that was the, yeah, that was an interesting cut. <laughs> could it like what would happen if you were living in the South American jungle two thousand years ago? Okay. And a, and a puma or and a, and a giant l puma jumped out at you, a tiger. Okay? It was like, rah, get the fuck out of here. Um, <laughs> your amygdala sends a signal uh, to a gangle of nerves on your neck right here and here called the stelet ganglion. That is your sympathetic nervous system. That's where you get when you almost swerve and hit your car, you almost fall. That's that thing that happens where your body goes into stimulus response to catch yourself or to avoid getting into an accident. That's your fight or flight system. Okay. Now, if that, um, normally when that happens, we're up for about four or five hours, maybe an hour or two, and then we come back to baseline. Well, if that trauma is too overwhelming, like in a sexual assault or your buddy seeing his head blown off in front of you, then, uh, that system does not come back to baseline. It stays up and it's actually a survival mechanism. If you think about it, if we all had random uh, reactions to survival, we wouldn't survive as a species. We need to have a, a homogenous reaction to threat. Okay. So if overwhelming threat changes your biology. I don't, I would rather answer that once we're going because I'll like how we know that. But what do you mean once we're going, you've been, you've been talking for quite some time, sir. It feels like a fucking a week, actually, if I'm being honest here, it feels like we've been listening to this for a long time. <laughs> oh my God. What do you mean? Once we get going, what do you think this is the pre-show, the pre-show fucking chit chat. And also this is like the, the most sane thing he's said so far. Like the, this at least I could agree that 
what he's said in the past like 20 seconds is probably true it's not my area of expertise but everything that he said before that was bonkers and i mean uh the homogenous reaction to this stuff i mean it's like he's I, we'll, we'll like be charitable and say he means like on a population level there might be slight differences yeah. in the way individuals handle stress or threats or whatever yeah it actually changes your biology and you can see it on a brain scan and with this treatment you can now that I, d- I don't i don't know about that what is he basing that on down the sympathetic nervous system it powers up 10 minutes later at baseline you can reset the nervous system to the pre-trauma state and and so it's it's you can't see it the way you can see a broken leg but i think as the awareness comes out with this book and everything uh it's why i wrote it was to kind of it's been at the extreme for 20 years obama endorsed it back in 2010. i want to bring it to the living room yoga instructors plumbers ceos teachers i think that 40 to 50 percent of the us and global population may be suffering from this injury and i think in five years this can be as people should be getting this the way they're getting lasik so what the fuck so just to re- recap like the interviewer's so bad he can't even be like what is the treatment <laughs> <laughs> right like is that the next or like what's your evidence for everything that you've claimed so far oh come on now he picked this interviewer <laughs> a guy like this picks this interviewer because he knows that that's not going to happen right yep <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 be clear here like but like, what is the treatment? Like, what, what what is the treatment? What does the treatment entail? Because you're gonna fucking lose your mind when you when it finally comes out what the treatment entails. Yeah, we we have a system that that uh, allows us to respond in a heightened manner to life stre- life threatening stimuli. Yes. Right? Um, but in the modern world with modern technology, let's just say the internet, uh, we're, we're constantly like juicing ourselves up with, you know, we, we see something happen, you know, a thousand miles away. And we, we think we, we feel that sympathetically, that stress on our system. And then we kind of go back to it and we, we seek yeah, to maintain it. Yeah. I mean, think, listen, it or, I, mean I could get, I, I have a lot I can say on this, right? I mean, I just, I believe you a very, um, well received you know i got the top trauma doctors and neuroscientists in the world to talk to me i mean they picked up the phone when you called but that doesn't really mean you talk to them (laughs) yeah so like what would that even mean like they talk to you and i i don't believe him i think i think like I guess if we're going to steel man him, it means that what he's saying is not so ridiculous that they would throw it out out of hand, but still like he needs evidence, right? Like he's making an extraordinary claim. He needs evidence. He needs extraordinary evidence, but like so far he hasn't given Evan any evidence at all. To be fair, he hasn't even described the treatment yet, but that's the interviewer's <laughs> fault. Because the interviewer, I don't even remember what the question was, if there was even a question just a moment ago. <laughs> okay, so I've been living this for a year and a half. Gabor Mate is on the cover of my book, you know. I, I, I mean, but the, the answer, you know, it's not, you know, it's really interesting what you just said, because um, it's an, our evolutionary biology for 50,000 years, conservatively, up until 300 years ago, was natural. We were living in natural environments. We were relatively agrarian. It wasn't until the in first, until three hundred years ago. I don't think so. Well, I don't know what he means by evolutionary biology. I think our like as far as our biology and evolution goes, yeah, it's been uh, much. It's humans have been pretty much the same biologically for uh, I'd say a little more than three thousand three hundred years. I'm just going out on a limb here. I'm not a evolutionary <laughs> biologist myself, but I think it's <laughs> like we've had cities for like what when was the first city like twenty thousand years ago we've had cities for like tens of thousands of years like cities aren't natural Ooh, somebody in chat somebody in chat is uh suggesting without suggesting maybe this guy should go talk to brett and heather next (laughs) 17th century coal and transportation that we started to really see the advent of what we call now cities so this is three no no absolutely (laughs) this guy doesn't think london existed before 1700 really 1724 (laughs) london established 1724 (laughs) right 
<laughs> the city we now call Tehran has been there for a, a while. Ah, <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, you <laughs> know, uh, Jerusalem. I've heard that Istanbul was Constantinople. That's nobody's business but the Turks. <laughs> 150 years old. Okay. Before, so right now we live in a time where we live in an artificial box. We get into another artificial box that roves to go into another artificial box. Okay. Oh, like one of them fucking Russian dolls. What are they called? We get it's a box inside a box inside a box. <laughs> <laughs> what are those fucking dolls called? I forget now. Uh, Ma- Matryoshka dolls Ma- Matry- or something. Yeah, Matryoshka dolls or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a Matryoshka box. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, man. I had no idea. <laughs> I, had, I thought this was going to be boring. This is wild. <laughs> this yeah. is fucking wild. Where we work all day and then we get back into the artificial box to go back to the and we hit it with all this messaging. We're not designed anatomically to deal with this constant stimulation. In fact, nature mitigates. How much you want to bet people said this about books when books first came out? People were like, we're not designed to handle that amount of stimulation. <laughs> or electricity, television, radio. Yep. The printing press. Yeah, like first of all, we're not designed to handle anything. We're right. not designed. Right. Well. But like we evolved to handle all sorts of things. We evolved to be a pretty like versatile creature. Humans I mean, some can of us, others adapt are- to a lot of things i mean you think some people are versatile but some people are more bottom than others so just keep that in mind (laughs) (laughs) if you feel wired and like shit oh my god it's you know having a horrible day you walk into nature you you calm right down you get present animals in nature make us i mean some people do that would that would stress a lot of people out a lot of people are very stressed about being in like a natural setting they don't like it normally mitigate us are gone and the overstimulation and the synthetic synthetic and artificial environments are uh how we live um so that's why i think the numbers are so high but you have to think of it uh, benjamin like if we were living in tiger infested jungle that system staying on from chronic stress would keep us alive but having oh hk i'm getting a little of you back once it gets Uh-oh. switched on, it's actually an injury, and it can't. You can't out yoga it. You can't out psilocybin it. Okay. You can't out right. You can't. I, oh, I, I people heard. have tried to out psilocybin, whatever the fuck he's talking about. That's for sure. I've I had some friends that took a lot of shrooms, a lot of <laughs> shrooms. Barbaric. It, once it's truly broken, and I can explain what that means anatomically. The only way to reset it is like resetting a broken leg. So people are doing all these therapeutics that are really valuable, but they're doing it over a broken leg you can't see. Okay. And how, how is that an injury? Like, what does that make? How does that make sense? Like it just, it, it's just constantly, well, in I mean, we've been calling it it mean- it, you know, in uh, world war one, they called it. Sh- how does that make sense? Is the first good question this guy asked, but he should have asked that uh, like <laughs> three sentences into this. <laughs> yes. Right. In world, I think in the civil war, they called it the invisible wound. Right. We started calling it, you know, the thousand yard stare, PTSD, um there's uh the, what does that mean you know, so he's missing uh, the obvious one it, they were calling it shell shock that's what they were calling he did it. mention that oh okay uh <clears throat> but yeah like uh it is i guess you could call it an injury i don't want to get i don't know like, I, I don't really i don't really i don't want really to i don't want to spend time on whether it's an injury or a disorder i feel like it's a distinction without a real difference yeah like i'm i'm not really i don't know why the guy asked that it doesn't this doesn't really seem to make any difference no bomb happy is the wrong term mr balls in vietnam <laughs> i think right uh but actually you've actually well i mean maybe we want to say this when we're rolling or i can tell you and we'll just go over it again yeah okay um basically um you want we, the we are rolling we are yeah i didn't press, oh that makes sense they're on e okay ask me if i'm you know, got it. You we're recording, and I have to say, got it. No, I. Yeah, no, we're. Re- I'm recording on three different levels. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Right, cool. No, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. So- Wait, did this guy not know that the interview started? Apparently, I like mm. assume like as soon as I connect to like Streamlabs or whatever with anybody that anything I'm saying is being recorded and broadcast, even if they're not. Like I just operate under that assumption, especially if I don't know them. 
I also record it myself <laughs> just in case you never know who's going to try to mischaracterize you and shit. Yep. <laughs> Think about it like this. Um, if, uh, okay. If you take a dog, a goat, a rabbit, a cat or a cow, there's a joke about them walking into a bar in there somewhere <laughs> and you beat it and terrorize it. That sounds, okay. Oh, yo dude, chill out. Don't do that. Uh, for a month, six months, and then you stop and you never t t terrorize it again. Okay. That animal will be different and it will be different in one of two ways. It will be timid or it will be highly aggressive. We didn't just give that cow or that cat or that rabbit a biological dis we, we didn't just give it a mental disorder. Okay. We, we changed its biology. No, you didn't change the animal's biology. I mean, in the sense that your brain is part of your biology. Sure. But like, it's not like you gave it new genes, right? This is so, this is so fuck. I, this guy has to talk to Brett and Heather. I, in fact, I demand that this man goes and talks to Brett and Heather. Like uh, the, I, I feel like the most you could say is that like you changed its hormonal response to different stimuli. Right. And you probably changed its like baseline hormone level. I imagine so. Mm. In that came out in 1970 called violence and the struggle for existence. And, uh, it was two years after written by a guy named Dr. Frank Ockberg, who does the forward to my book, who also defined Stockholm syndrome for the FBI in the 1970s. Well, that and, was great. I, I think someone had defined that before the 1970s. <laughs> I don't know the history of Stockholm syndrome, but I think that, uh, it probably was, uh, this is weird. And he uh, wrote this book with, all, with a bunch of Stanford scientists in the 1970s. Coretta Scott King did the uh, intro to that book because it was two years after Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And there's a chapter in there called Biology and Aggression, where they give the example that I just gave you. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, 35, 40 years later that that doctor who wrote that book the, um, came across my co-author, Dr. Lipov, who'd figured out what the mechanism is. So what we call it an injury because you've actually created a biological change in your body, which is now affecting your brain that you can remediate. Okay. So it, it's a, it's a broken leg. You can't see, but in, 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 well, the doc likes to say it's a broken leg. You can't see unless you have the wrong scanner. So how it works is um, if you have overwhelming trauma or you carry chronic stress, you can get this from distant parents. You can get this from your dad not hugging. I'll say I, I don't disagree with his characterization there. Uh, but again, I feel like that doesn't matter to this conversation, right? Whether like, or not I don't you think anyone uh, really... another, whether or not you a non-expert just dis don't disagree with this other non-experts characterization. Yeah. I don't think that matters that much. You are absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> but like, I, it, are there people saying like that, people suffering from ptsd like it's all in their head I, well i'm sure there are yeah i, I don't know i mean it, <laughs> but the, the it's it's all in your head as a dismissive way to describe something going on in your brain which is the thing that controls yeah. everything you do so yeah <clears throat> like that's like okay well there's a lot of shit that's all in your head like whether or not i decide to jack off before bed tonight is all in my head too right like <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean like your your brain is the most important organ in your body. It's like the one thing that you can't transplant to something else. Cause like when you do that, you're transplanting yourself. Like yeah, but the, your brain is you. So yeah, like if something goes wrong with your brain, yeah, absolutely. That's, that can be like an injury that could be like, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with what he's saying there. Right. But if that's true, how did Jamie mustard take his brain out, put it in an air fryer and then put it back in his own head? <laughs> <laughs> or bullying or what's really really tragic and this is how i think it relates to you know ge some gender dysphoria because i'm an ally of people that are really suffering from that but it's been you know it's a mess it, the number <laughs> just the real oh no he's like i have i'm an ally but of the real trans 
Or it was like the remember that fucking thing we watched about the moderate gays. It sounds like that. You remember that where they're like, I went to Pride and there were asses and dicks everywhere, and the moderate gays had no place at Pride. It, that's a version of that. That's right. I forget. Yeah. That was like, a kill. oh, it was fucking uh, Claire, Caliper Claire from Killette was talking about that. Yeah. Like, yo, dude, fucking, what if you don't? I, okay, first, like, you could just be fucking kind to people or even just mind your own business. Cause I don't, I, I don't, I don't get the feeling this guy has a lot of trans friends and maybe not a lot of friends. He seems like a fucking grifter. Kind of hard to keep your friends as a grifter, right? I would assume so. Yeah. It don't make any sense. Right. So, um, I do believe that, it, that it's, it's highly connected to what we're seeing in terms of gender dysphoria, in terms of, of the preteen girls. Right. You can because the comparison culture for a young girl um, is staggeringly stressful. And we weren't telling young girls in the past that, um, you know, you, they were kind of coveted by their family. Now, you can't be a young girl and not being told, not be told in every aspect of media that um, you're not safe. He's back to this again. Okay. Like young girls were coveted by their family. I don't even know what that means. Cause in certain cultures, no, they weren't. I think he's trying to say that we used to shelter young girls more, which like that might be true, but also I would consider that a, bad thing to a certain extent like well it depends sheltering how someone to the point that it harms them is not good well these are you know how how young and how much are you sheltering them like obviously like your fucking six-year-old you should probably shelter the shit out of your six-year-old boy yes. or girl like, right because they yeah but he they're, they're six he said preteen girls so i'm assuming he means like 11 and 12 which at that point they should have a little more leeway i mean sure. probably not like out I think at 11 you and I, as non, I think you and i as non-parents of teenage girls should talk about parenting uh, <laughs> teenage girls some more that'll be fun <laughs> but also oh, yeah, like yeah. i feel like that hasn't really changed like i i don't he's kind of implying that like preteen girls nowadays are just allowed out on the streets to do whatever and i don't think that's true i no. don't think there are a lot of parents of preteen girls just letting their girls do whatever the fuck they want in fact i think that you know all indications are that people are inside more now because of the internet thing that he was talking about before what are you riding a skateboard down the street checking your instagram no you're just checking your instagram <laughs> you don't have the fucking skateboard there's no little girls out roller skating anymore you know, all those memes about how, oh, back in the day we used to go out and all the bike, we all ride our bikes or well, he's fucking those people they're, 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 that meme is stupid in a way, but it, it is true that like young people were out more like children were out, went out to play more, I suppose. But like, no, yeah. like, what is he talking about? Does he just mean that like fucking 13 year olds have Instagram, which I probably shouldn't have. Yeah. But, I, I would not like if if I had a daughter, I would not let her be on Instagram until she was like late teens. Well, that's good. This is about you. This this we are talking about you as a potential. Parent. <laughs> but like, I agree with him in in that regard. Social media that's is not bad what he said. for now. We're now we're now we're writing fanfic about what he said okay. because what he's saying is so <laughs> incredibly mind expandingly stupid. HK. Yeah. <laughs> no. You're not or you're not enough. enough. Yeah, you're not enough. You're not yeah. straight. That's a massive amount of stress. So what happens is when you carry chronic allostatic load like I did from poverty and childhood abandonment, or you uh, have this blunt force, like, uh, well, I'll give the example of a blunt force trauma. Okay. Um, your brain, your amygdala sends a signal to this ganglion of nerves in your neck. That's what jerks you into either save your life or to fight and kill the tiger. Peter Levine's work, Running from the Tiger. Um, if that's too overwhelming, or you carry the threat of tigers for too long, that's really good if you live in a chronic, chronic, uh, uh, a tiger-infested jungle. Because he was going to call, if you live in a chronic tiger area, he almost said a chronic <laughs> tiger area. Did you hear that? I'm down. That's a much better description. <laughs> a chronic tiger area. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, this is fucking, this is fucking next level stupid. Hyper vigilant and you're careful for the tigers or because a tiger almost killed you. You're going to be careful for tigers for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. So it's good that it, it helps us to survive to change our anatomy 2000 years ago. Okay. Uh, but what's actually happening in the body is when you send that <laughs> 2000 years ago, when everyone was always surrounded by tigers. <laughs> it was just there, there before Jesus famously attacked by tigers several times in his life there. But for the grace of tigers, go I <laughs> you get the you have nerves here. That is the fight or flight system. Um, when the trauma is too overwhelming, or you carry the chronic stress. You get two changes. You get a change in the brain. You get an increase in of norepinephrine. So I'm very skeptical of the fact that the nerves in your neck cause the fight or flight response. You got me, man. I'm just, I just like highly skeptical of that claim. I am not going to endeavor to fact check it. I just, that's one of those things where you're like, well, that doesn't wait. You would, you would think that it would be uh, part of your brain that does that. Maybe there's, uh, maybe he's talking about a little bit of brain that's <laughs> in your neck. Oh God. <laughs> a little bit of your neck brain. <laughs> oh my God. This guy's. <laughs> You got the galaxy brains, and then you got the neck brain. This guy's a neck brain. <laughs> it's, like, it's like even worse than a neck beard. And NGF, what's called nerve growth factor. So now where there was four ner nerves here, there's now eight. What? Or 12. So what that means anatomically is this signal, these, these nerves in your neck, your sympathetic nervous system, is reversing. The signal's reversing, telling your brain 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year um that your life is in danger that you're you, that you're under threat i mean imagine this well i mean look me, man i follow a lot of tiger accounts on instagram okay it's <laughs> I, i'm always seeing them <laughs> okay i am terrified of my instagram feed because it's all tigers and i think they're real and also also you know what i'm doing i'm comparing myself to that tiger because that tiger is in good fucking shape <laughs> that that tiger's got drip, right? <laughs> Jesus, fuck. those stripes. Mm. Yeah, I wish so I, in right now. <laughs> God, what a, what a fucking it's just such a strong, powerful, uh, raw meat eating man, or maybe a woman <laughs> tiger. I don't know. Tigress. Uh, so that tiger is fetch. I can cry. Holy shit. What the <laughs> Athena in chat. That tiger's making more than me. <laughs> How did that tiger get a Lambo? <laughs> yeah, okay. I follow the at tigers driving Lambos Instagram, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> it makes my life worse, but I love to see it. <laughs> So the most innocuous banal circumstance feels like life or death. And I can get into exactly what those symptoms are. Yeah, let's, There's, let's do like a... I feel like a lot of that is because our lives are so cushy right now, though. Like, a lot of us don't experience life or death situations. Like, at all. Hold on, HK. The interviewer is going to... I don't know. What, I don't know what the interviewer is going to do here, actually. <laughs> going to say words. Going to be like, man, this guy's been talking. I don't know. How, how long should I let this guy talk? Now, look, he's holding his neck because now he's having a traumatic experience listening to fucking Jamie Mustard talk. He's just trying to hold in his neck brain. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what those symptoms are. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do like a anecdote, just a personal anecdote about why, why for you was poverty so stress inducing? Wait, you have to ask somebody why poverty is so stressful. That's interesting why why is it stressful to not be sure that you'll be able to eat tomorrow right. just, like, like I've been why fortunate. would that be stressful i've been fortunate enough to um i don't think i've ever been in poverty i'm a uh, I stream for a living so you know the jury's out on uh whether or not i'm lower middle class or lower lower middle class but uh but i i i can definitely understand like not sure like you move around a lot maybe you get a, parents get evicted um don't have your own bedroom like all kinds of like you don't have to 
Like what the fuck interviewer? Yeah, like I fortunately I have never even been close to poverty. Uh, I've always been solidly in the middle class, but I can definitely understand why being poor would be stress inducing. Like why, you know, knowing that if you have like one small issue, like your car breaks down on the way to work, you might not be able to afford food next week. Like, yeah, that would be extremely stress inducing. Yeah, I could totally see that. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I mean, for me, I didn't even know if it was going to work on me. I, I I came to this treatment as a patient and befriended the doctor. And then because I'm an artist. Oh, that's inappropriate. That that wasn't the question, though. But that's inappropriate, too, right? Like to befriend the person, like to befriend a doc, like especially in like a, something like PTSD or whatever. You probably the doctor, probably not a good candidate for your bestie. Yeah. <laughs> and a successful author, I ended up thinking that this was so important to write a book on it because it was out there. It was just at the extremes. It was, it was at 9-11 first responders, uh, the, the military uh, or special forces. I mean, I started, it was when I went to, I got invited for my art and communications work to speak at Fort Bragg to special forces and, and um, psychological operations. And that's when my interest got peaked in the subject. I was never interested in trauma. I was never interested in post-traumatic stress. I was in denial about my own my entire life. But I okay. was born in and raised in and out of institutional environments um, oh, and okay. with very little human touch in, in abject poverty near downtown, in and around downtown Los Angeles, in Mexican neighborhoods. Okay. okay? I was at Fort Bragg speaking for my, like, Malcolm Gladwell type work that I do. Motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> just compared himself to Malcolm Gladwell. Get the fuck out of here, dude. Get the fuck out of here absolutely a fuck off um which has to do with art and and business and um this guy uh jeff dardia who runs the health initiative task force at fort bragg showed me this thing called operator syndrome on his phone it was identical to what i now know is an overactive sympathetic nervous system and i can go through those symptoms with you when i first saw that on his phone at fort bragg i didn't see benjamin I wasn't interested in the military. When I first got invited to speak, I was not wanting to do it. You know, I know what violence looks like. I know I wasn't really interested in assisting the U.S. military or, you know, being involved in somebody that was going to help with American foreign policy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I developed a relationship with two special forces colonels, and I have a different point of view on that now. OK, uh, at least in relation to the special forces. So I went and did it. Um, but when I was looking at that operator syndrome, which is a military condition that you get, if you're never in a firefight, you're just in Afghanistan for a year away from your family with the threat of death. When I first saw those eight or nine symptoms, and I can walk you through them, I didn't see the military. I saw the Mexican neighborhoods where I grew up, and my mind started reeling. And I got so I go, I wonder, I wonder if I went into a prison with a, uh, and interviewed murderers they grew up in poverty and had this injury and they were suffering from a crime, uh, you know, they committed an impulse crime when they were 20. If they would have the exact same quote mental symptoms, which are really biological is a biological injury as a person coming back from Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And uh, a year and a half ago, I did that. I went in with a film crew and interviewed murderers to see if they were having the same symptoms, man. Uh, there's there something I really want to say right now that I can't say about his uh, experience with murderers. I just can't say the thing that I want to say right now. It's it's a violation of many terms of service and just the wrong thing to say. So I think that what he's saying is there's probably something to that. You know, I don't see anything wrong with this, but again, like he hasn't described his miracle cure. So if he doesn't describe it before you, before we get out of here, before we go um, to the post game, so, I will uh, you know, spill the beans on him. Operator syndrome. Okay. And operator the miracle syndrome. cure, by the way, not magic beans. Because will, special, <laughs> they, call, they call special operations forces. Okay. So when you work as special forces in the military, you're called an operator. Okay. 
Okay, that's why they call it operator syndrome. So here's an anecdote. Say I have, so he, can I go through the symptoms and give you a really- Yeah, please. And just, just for your sake of discussion, how, what's the turnover rate for these operators, the, these special forces? Is it like four years, 10 years? I guess it, I guess it varies. I mean, most I wonder... of these guys don't ever get deployed more than, you know, 36 months at the outset. You know, you, okay. it starts to wear on you. Um, when we, I'm nervous, you know, one of the, when I first just, uh, uh, started bre- talking to the military about this, cause these colonels that invited me to Fort Bragg, they run all the training for all of special forces. And one of them said to me, they knew nothing about this, even though they were already doing 10 a day at Womack, but they were doing it off of an old paper. So they weren't getting the result that we see now. And, um, when I was first telling these colonels who are now close friends about it, they say, oh, don't, you know, the military is going to... I mean, to be fair, most colonels are not my close friend either. Why did he have to say that? that I was telling these colonels, oh, they're not close friends of mine. Well, great. You know, I was at the, I was at the <laughs> store and um, I was talking to the cashier, not a close friend of mine. And uh, like, wh- who the fuck, like what? Why the fuck, why is it, what, what does that even mean? They so said, they're going to use it to turn people around in the field. And I said, come on. And then a year later, I was at Fort Bragg, and I found out that Delta Force was already doing that. What do you mean? Right? So if, if somebody starts uh, getting off their game, then they go through this treatment to get back on yeah, the game? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Olympic athletes will do this treatment. Say somebody like Lindsey Vaughn, I'm not calling her out. You're talking about cupping? Gets into a skiing accident at 65 miles an hour, okay? Her reaction time and her ability to ski is going to change. She goes, resets her sympathetic over... Uh, and then her reaction times go back to normal. The, arm, the military studied this the most and proven that uh, the Navy SEAL, the Navy did a study, I think, that proven that when they went, people went out and reset this nervous system, that the reaction times went back to normal huh. or okay. close to it. Um, okay. But so not, it, not better. If, if, you, if you don't have trauma, you take this, you're not going to like, it's not going to, it's not enhancing performance. It's resetting performance. To it's resetting baseline. performance. Okay. It's okay. resetting performance. But if you made it into Delta Force, or you're an Olympian, you're a high performer. In fact, that's one of the th- reasons that I was willing, I got it. You know, like I was in denial about being even traumatized till about six years ago. I, I reached a level, a certain level of success and I wasn't as happy as what I was. Dri- I thought if poverty and ignorance meant pain, then affluence and education would mean contentment or pleasure, <laughs> you know? So I pursued those things and overshot over, uh, got further than I thought I maybe could have. I mean, I tried. And w- as I got more successful, th- that wasn't go. Those feelings were going away. And that freaked me out. Okay. So I knew a military psychologist through my literary agent. And he started telling me about this. And then I had a forensic neuroscientist that I knew, uh, who's a clinician and a researcher, um, vet it for me. Okay. Uh, and so to me, the idea that it was a biological injury, because when you grow up like in, with abandonment, like I was, you yeah. not you don't go to doctors. So the idea that I would fly to Chicago and do this uh, treatment that's not, you know, known outside of, I mean, it's been on Rogan. It's been on 60 Minutes. It's been on CBS. Oh, Sports. God. <laughs> it's been on Rogan. Okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mention that if I were you. You want it to be taken seriously. <laughs> I'm. Where, where, you know, why wouldn't artists write a book with a with a well known researcher and prominent scientist? Because I didn't see the extreme. I saw the living room. I saw tons of people in America that don't think they had trauma, don't think their kids have had trauma, don't think their spouses had trauma, yet they have these symptoms, which I I can give you. Yeah. And yeah, you said that, but could you just fucking? It's a list of eight. Could you just bang off this? He's going to take like fucking thirty minutes to give us these eight fucking things. Watch. <laughs> And, um, you know, and so, and they're, so they're, they're confused. And so I wanted that truth out there. Uh, 12, you know, 12, in 2012, Frank Ochberg, a famous psychiatrist who defined Stockholm syndrome for the FBI. He, uh, in the seventies, he tried to, he's now, pu- he started pushing at the name change from post-traumatic stress disorder to post-traumatic stress injury, which is what it is. Okay. okay so, so Yeah. Uh, just just to ground it, couch it in your story. So, uh, if, if somebody grows up in your um, in the conditions that you do, there, there's kind of like I guess there's maybe more than two paths to take. But one is to you know try to succeed at life. 
Mm-hmm. And the other is to kind of succumb to criminality or just succumb to like, I, I live in a shitty world. I'm going to be a shitty person or I live sure. in, I live, I got a shitty lot. I'm going to try to improve my lot. So you went the, I'm going to try to improve my lot route. But every time you achieved some sort of success or, or step out of your trauma, your baseline, your baseline would just like follow you. Like you, you would just, you would be chased by it, it, these so symptoms. No one's ever put it that way, but it's it, an incredibly astute, and and spot on way. Of Wait, nobody's no one's ever put it that way because that's a weird way to put it. <laughs> no shit. Your man. baseline follows you into. A, I. <laughs> your baseline. Your baseline is just where you start, right? So, like, wherever you go, it would be like relatively above your baseline. So, yeah, if your baseline is elevated, it would be relatively above that compared to. If your baseline were at normal, yeah, quote sure. unquote. Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking, yeah. Yes. No. I don't know. Maybe that's uh, what he meant, <laughs> but he put uh, it very poorly. <laughs> same, you know, and then seven years ago, you know, I was signed to the agency group. I mean, I eventually moved agents, which became, which was bought by uh, UTA. So I was at one of the top talent agencies in the world. At the, being represented by the head of literary who also represented my heroes, the RZA, Bill Nye the Science Guy, you know, mm-hmm. I was in the same stable as Eminem and 50 Cent for literary, right? Yeah. And and then things just have progressed from there. You know, I have had a very unusual life. I was I could read at a high level at a young age, but as far as education was concerned, I was semi-literate until I was 19. And I got an opportunity to change my life by a relative that offered me a very unique proposition to focus on studies. With Wait, he could read at a high level when he was young, but he was only semi-literate until he was 19? Yeah, I've, that's, <clears throat> I fucking... This is... Okay, so this is... Top... Easy top 10 biggest dumb fucks we've ever covered on the intellectual dollar tree right <laughs> yep be on my back and it just turned out without poverty sitting on my back i mean i started off doing remedial classes at a community college uh at 19 years old for i probably had a first grade writing re- level and math level um and five and a half years later i graduated Less than five and a half years later, I graduated from the London School of Economics. So I've had a very interesting trajectory of living in both extremes, Benjamin. I've lived in the worst kind of poverty you can imagine. Five people, no air conditioning, eight people in a 100 square foot apartment with no No, air- that's 10 by 10. There's no eight people in a one. That's a 10 by 10. Friend, no. <laughs> no, I, I disagree. <laughs> you need four bunk beds in a 10 by 10 room. Two to a bed. <laughs> Oh, no, yeah, four bunk beds. No, two bunk, well, whatever. Air conditioning and a hot plate and dust and decay everywhere. And dr- How much dust and decay can you put in a 10 by 10 room? It was drought weather, right? I mean, you know, real roach infested environments where when I when I, I slept on a floor as a kid and had to and would sleep with my a shirt over my face so that roaches wouldn't crawl in my mouth. We're talking, you know, I don't want to gross everyone out, but like I've seen a lot of reality. I'm and not then, grossed out because I don't believe you. And... Very quickly, I was around the wealthiest, most uh, privileged people in the world. Yeah. And that has been a, I think it's given me a unique perspective on how I see pretty much everything. But I just, it, it's just kind of, a, it's, a, it's an American, or it's just a classic story like rags to riches, right? But there's something, yeah, I mean, even in those contexts, there's something. It definitely sounds like a grift. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a fucking classic story of a grifter. <laughs> yeah. It's like when Drake said, we started at the bottom, now we're here, and then you found out Drake uh, grew, grew up in a pretty pretty nice suburb, actually. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, the bottom relative. Uh, so you well, could, you, yeah. just to give to the... My aunt and uncle had more money than mom and dad. We started at the bottom. Give the lie it's to... like the bottom of the upper middle class. You pull yourself out, but you're just like working hard enough is going to, to save you. That's a, that's, a, that's a lie. Yeah. You can't... There, like, there's no such thing as a self-made person, in my opinion. I've never seen one. Okay? I had angels at various stages. I, I had various physical conditions because I was not being observed. Angels? That almost killed me several times as a child, where in that last lick of time, I was rushed to the hospital okay. Okay. by a relative that came by. Right. 
So, um, okay. So not like it is, angels, but like people he describes as angels. Okay. And this is another one of those things where medical records are private. So there's no way, I mean, fucking that's, there's no way to fact check that. Right. And fucking good reason. Yep. Medical records should be <laughs> private, but for, man, I don't know. I, I, I'm just not, I don't mean to No, I do mean to disparage this guy as a liar. I don't believe most of what he's telling me here. I have no, I have no evidence. I mean, to the contrary. I could, I could describe exactly the same story that I had a condition that almost killed me and a relative came by and rushed me to the hospital and it saved me. But like, I'm just describing having appendicitis and my dad taking me to the hospital. A, <laughs> um, once you have this injury, like, you know, you, the, 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 the symptoms are what you'd experience if you were running from a tiger, if a tiger was chasing you. God damn it, he is really fucking that? concerned with running from a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he runs the tiger Instagram account that I follow. <laughs> also, by the time you're running from the tiger, it's over, friend. Unless you have somebody with you that you're faster than. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel like outrunning the tiger definitely depends on like what else is in the area <laughs> like is the tiger easily distracted by shiny objects who knows yeah for about 90 seconds or is there a cliff the you could jump off of into tiger. like the water below that the tiger's not willing to <laughs> so when we live there all the time it discombobulates our immune system it destroys the scavenger system on our immune system discombobulate cancer it leads to autoimmune disease yeah we, you know nadine burke harris has done uh, a physician in oakland has done incredible work where she's proven that our aces score adverse childhood experiences is the leading cause of disease in adults well what's the mechanism that do no no no, no maybe no, no, whatever no. neighborhood he grew up in had like a tiger infestation hold on hk listen to this Physician in okay. Oakland has done incredible work where she's proven that our ACEs score, adverse childhood experiences, is the leading cause of disease in adults. Well, what's. No, no. This is, first of all, he's probably just butchering someone's work, but <clears throat> like these adverse childhood events or whatever are correlated with poverty. If you were born yeah. into poverty, you were more likely to be pover impoverished as an adult, and you were going, if you were impoverished as an adult, you were more, less likely to get good medical care, and as such, you were more likely to. Uh, suffer from disease preventable diseases because you haven't had medical care yep yeah he is confusing correlation with causation he's also name dropping somebody which is a little bit but i'm not again like we don't we don't have this is like a treasure trove of like shit that somebody other than me could look into all these claims and just obliterate this guy in a blog post i think I mean, a lot of the claims that he's making are like, they sound like fanciful descriptions of normal events. Mechanism the doing it. yes. it's the over, it's the, it's the nervous system being discombobulated. That's causing all the trouble. Okay. You know, if you've read body keeps the score, great. The body keeps the score. That's true. Now what? Yeah. If bo the body keeps the score, the sympathetic nervous system is the scorekeeper. That's what's causing the damage and okay. it can now be reset. So as far as like growing up in that environment, you either succumb like, yeah, they, they, they talk about what becomes a dark, cynical personality, which is really a biological injury. I know now, but I've read academic papers on what's called a dark cynicism uh, that when poverty or that kind of mindset overtakes you. But that's really a biological injury. It's not a it's truly a cynicism. OK, um, hmm. and uh, you so for me. I was not thinking uh, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to fight and I'm going to make it. I was thinking I'm fucking desperate and I'm going to try. Okay. Um, and it was a struggle, but I kept my nose. Was clean. it? Cause he I, said I, a I few minutes ago that it was like immediate. As soon as he got out of poverty, it was like he was around the richest people in the world. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought we were, I thought we were going to get some like boring medical misinformation, but this is, this is something else. <laughs> it sounds to me like it was not a struggle. It took him what? Five years to go from like first grade education to college graduate. 
And then, uh, then his, uh, I don't know, his ad agency or whatever got bought by Eminem. I forget what he fucking said then. No, not Eminem, but by Eminem's <laughs> fucking talent agency. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. This is fucking wild. I was playing chess in the environment to a degree that I was not going down the path that my brother went down a little bit. I was like, you know, I saw him. You know, I'm, I'm really stricken by this guy's humility. Through. And I was like, I'm not gonna doing any of that. I'm not going <laughs> to take anything. I'm not going to. Uh, and so... But it was more, it was never, eventually... It I think he rivals Eric Weinstein but, for the most humble um, man in the world. I was never thinking that I'm going to overcome this and go to one of the top, most prestigious schools in the world. Uh, never. I was more just, I have to get the fuck away from here. And it turned out, uh, but, but 100%, you know, what, what you're making me think of a little bit is Horatio Alger, more than Charles Dickens. Hmm. You know Horatio Alger? He wrote all these books, I think, in the 30s. He was one of the most prolific writers in the 30s, and he was different than Dickens, with you know, which is that great story that you're talking about, that great American story, which is Rags to Riches. Horatio Alger wrote all these books, and it was more like Rags to Respectability, huh. right? The guy got out of poverty, and maybe he didn't get rich, but he got, he did well, and he got the girl, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, it, and those stories in the 30s, I think it was post- so Like a rom-com? Depression where he was probably the biggest writer in the world. With those stories post depression, I could have my timeline wrong, but I but I I think so, mm -hmm. and so yeah, so that's what I think. Um, but, but you but get out of poverty, but that poverty sticks with you. The poverty oh, yeah. mindset, oh, yeah. maybe. Oh yeah, oh yeah, man. And I so mean, like, what are, what are some of those symptoms that when you came across this in in like the battle scarred you know operators that you're like, wait, hold on, this is me. How did you yeah. see that reflected? Well, I saw really what I saw Mexicans. You know, I, I, I grew up in Mexican <laughs> neighborhood. God, shut the fuck up. Dude, why is he? Oh, you know, it was just like, you know, Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> this guy has no idea how funny he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And I, and I hated it. But I always had a deep affinity for Mexican people because of the family values, the work ethic. One thing I learned when I was a really young boy, and then I'll answer your question, is I would watch these guys. And there, you know, we, we have this park in LA that is a working class park. Uh, I mean, everybody uses it, but more working class people use it called Griffith Park. And if you stumble across a Mexican birthday party and you're five years old, seven years old, and they have a pinata, they'll let any kid join. And that's magic, right? So, you know, I hated the poverty at the time, you know, when I got older, I realized that it was a great privilege to live in a cultural mix like that, to just be bombarded with so much diversity, even though I was unaware of it at the time. But yeah, so yeah, this is me. Okay, so you'd have to look at it like the symptoms you'd experience if you were running from a tiger. Okay, if a tiger jumped out. <laughs> oh my, wait, was there a tiger at the birthday party? What? Is, was this guy traumatized by what happened to um, uh, Siegfried and Roy, or what the fuck's happening here? <laughs> what happened to him with the tiger? Was he mauled by a tiger? Do we not know? I hope so. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's, I guess it's rude to wish tiger mauling on anyone, I suppose. But, <laughs> but like, it, it, is it rude to wish past tiger mauling onto someone? <laughs> Oh man, he you know what he was really afraid of was those little Latigra t shirts that had the little tiger on the on the on the breast. He's like, No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Anything but that shirt, mom. Oh, he grew up in poverty. Those were <laughs> out of his out of his league, right? <laughs> Anxiety about the tiger? Is the tiger gonna eat me? You'd have a Well, it's not gonna eat you, it's going to attack you. you the tiger you're not food. You it sees you as a threat. You're react you'd be reactive you know where's the tiger where's the tiger you'd be is the tiger in the room with you right now mr mustard you know what it was, it was, you know what in, the, in, in this fucked up game of clue actually it was jamie mustard in the in the entryway with the tiger <laughs> he's he's using the tiger as a weapon yes yes he, yes, he fucking killed the person with the tiger obviously <laughs> oh Man, it's been a, this might be the best episode of the Intellectual Dollar Tree we've ever done. <laughs> yeah. So we're 
we're about an hour 20 in. So I'm going to tell you what the treatment is because I have a feeling he may not even say what it is. The treatment is they inject some shit into your neck. Like where you like your, he's saying those nerves that are your sympathetic nervous system. They do some kind of injection. What are they injecting into your neck? I'm not that sure. It could be like a, it might not even be that they're injecting a substance into your neck. It might be more like an acupuncture or a type thing. Okay. That sounds very sketchy. And like, I would need to see a tremendous amount of evidence before I would even believe at all that that had an effect. Like, not even the effect that he's describing, but an effect at all. So, real quick, the reason I came across him was as we were watching what we'll call, what we've now started calling the anti Scientology perverts, uh, there was a person who wanted this treatment from the, uh, there's a charity, the Aftermath Foundation, that's named after Leah Remini's show, but it is not Leah Remini's charity. It's run by like Mike Rinder and used to be our friend Aaron Smith Levin, friend, was on the board. And people got mad that they weren't willing to pay for this treatment because it was like not um, an approved treatment or that was the, that was the line that they were saying. I think there was, oh, I think that the, I think that in the end they were willing to pay for it, but she, the person had to sign a release like that. They, she wouldn't okay. hold the aftermath foundation responsible for any negative effects from the treatment. At first, I think they were, not inclined to do it as, as uh, fucking you shouldn't be. And yep. then they <laughs> said, well, I, and I'm, I could be getting the storyline wrong here. And, but uh, they eventually people got mad cause they wanted them to sign a release. But then it turned out that this was a very common release form that people were signing for okay. with the, with this charity. And it was kind of boilerplate that people might sign for other charities or other like people that would maybe get a grant or whatever for some kind of treatment just to not hold the people who paid for it responsible if something went sideways. Okay. And that's totally reasonable. Although I think it was unreasonable for them to agree to pay for this, but that's how we, uh, yep. That's how this came across my radar. And I'm, I'm guessing too, that this treatment is not cheap. Ooh, fucking you are, uh, you are probably, you are probably right. Ding, 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 ding. I don't think it's tens uh, of thousands of dollars, but I think like, <clears throat> I think like, yeah, somebody in chat, it's like five grand for like the, I guess one course of this treatment and insu- for a shot in the neck or shots in the neck or whatever. And I insurance tends not to cover it for um, obvious reasons of who knows what solution or if it's anything. Yeah. Now I haven't looked that deeply into this, but I did ask uh, Marcus homozygote about it. And uh, actually what uh, Hack All The Things just said was pretty much Marcus's response. He was like, holy fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, I'm not super scientifically literate or medically literate, but our our friend Marcus is uh, able to able to take a look at some stuff. You know, he's an academic. This is his this is within like the, you know, within like a maybe one ring outside of his area of expertise, but he certainly has the background to take a look at this. And, um, uh, yeah, not great. Not fucking great. <laughs> I'm not super medically literate, but I know how to sniff out a scam when I see one. And this is a scam. Right. Right. Because it's, <clears throat> and the fact that like he went in and was preying on, um, ex Scientologists for this through, uh, basically through Aaron Smith Levin and the, the SPTV creators for a moment. I think he stopped trying to do that because uh, people started um, uh, taking, t- other people started taking a little too close a look at what the fuck was going on here and probably not great for him. So it doesn't seem like he's <laughs> super active in trying to recruit people that are former Scientologists in into this, um, or I'm just not seeing it. But boy, how did people take a look into this and the, the, what you what everybody saw was like oh this doesn't look great (laughs) yep and are you surprised at all that they're suggesting that about 50 percent of people should get their treatment right or or yeah yeah (laughs) roughly half of all people should give me five thousand dollars that's just (laughs) what i'm saying you know to be fair he's not the one administering the treatment but i also am 
I also, I, I just don't know if this is, uh, if there's like an MLM type situation going on here or. <laughs> yeah. If he's in someone's downstream. <laughs> right, right. <He's laughs> yeah. It might be that he's a victim himself. You know, oh, he might be he, out he, here. He got the treatment. Uh, yes. Yeah. But what I'm saying is like, he might be a true believer who was scammed by this treatment uh, and, you know, had some sort of placebo effect and thinks that it's real. Oh dear. So this isn't great, right? This is, this, this is okay. First of all, like this, this person was making claims in such a way that I probably should have put him on conspiracy bingo. If we're being honest, like he's, (laughs) but this was, um, this is definitely a crossover again, because it's, it's just fucked up that he like used this community of people that had left a cult, like as a place to recruit folks for this treatment. Yeah. And there's also like there, there was this kernel of truth in what he was saying where like, you know, you could see like, yeah, that makes sense. Like a lot of the things that he was saying were completely plausible. You know, the, the relationship between growing up in poverty and suffering through something like being in Afghanistan, you know, that kind of relationship of these very stressful situations that have like a, a, an impact on the rest of your life. Uh, but then he would say these wild things like, uh, you know, that like you're, you're living as if you're scared of a tiger all the time. Uh, (laughs) and then, you know, I'm assuming eventually he was going to say, and all you need to do is get this $5,000 shot in your neck and it'll cure you of all your tiger fears. So I'm not sure whether or not you're going to be able to stick around for the post game. I'm actually going to watch the rest of this, but uh, if you were going to predict whether or not he would, he's going to describe the treatment, do you think he is going to, or is not going to? He's got like an hour left. I think he is going to because like there's an hour. <laughs> what else is he going to talk about? Well, I know exactly what else he's going to talk about. Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> Can you fill another hour with tigers? <laughs> no, Ducky and Chad is like, it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy, was this a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be. I was like, I don't know about this. This might be boring. But, oh, no, this was not boring. <laughs> Maybe he just always had a a box of Frosted Flakes, like, in various different cupboards in his kitchen. And, like, as a child, he would open it and see Tony the Tiger and just be, uh, you know, just have, like, trauma from seeing Tony the Tiger all the time. You know, when he mentioned, like, when you see a Mexican birthday party and they let any kid hit the pinata, was the pinata a tiger? I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Fuck. Or maybe the pinata was full of tigers. Oh, no. So that- he was he was having this happy moment hitting the pinata, and all of a sudden, boom, tigers. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get to the bottom of this guy's tiger trauma. <laughs> Holy shit. All right. All right. I don't know. Can you hold it together enough to close the show out or to fucking read the show out? You doing all right over there? Uh, yep. <laughs> this has been the Intellectual Dollar Tree. We normally do this show every uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m., but sometimes we stretch it back a little further because it's very hot. Uh, that is Pacific time. You can catch us live at twitch.tv slash Ecoplex media. And if you want to check out our other shows, you can find them at Ecoplex uh, And if you want to support us, you can do that at patreon.com slash Ecoplex or eplex.store. If you're listening live, stick around for ask after the song where we'll have red light, the show after the show. And if you're listening to the podcast, maybe check us out live sometime. Uh, this is boomers by Periscope.